Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit work in our hearts and in our lives as we reflect and meditate upon your word this day. May that same Spirit keep us in this true faith that you've granted us to that day that we see Jesus come again in the clouds of glory with all of his angels. We ask this in his name. Amen. I'm kind of curious, how many of you, when kids are around Christmas, do you have to say, be patient about opening gifts? Anybody? Yeah. Be patient. Yeah, we work at teaching our children to be patient. And then if you're anything like me, when the guy ahead of you is sitting at that right turn, green arrow is not going, you're on the horn, right? No patience. I will, I will be the first to admit I am an impatient person. I just am. I, I get impatient when people don't follow the follow the road lights, you know, when the light's green and people are sitting there. I just get impatient. I've learned not to honk my horn as much, I just got to say, but I still do every now and then. I'm just confessing here, folks, to everybody. I'm an impatient guy. I'm the same way in a restaurant lots of times, right, if it seems like the service is kind of slow. One of my favorite stories, Sally and I were out with dinner one day, or lunch one day with some friends. And we went to a restaurant and we were sitting there and it seemed like no one around us was getting served their food. And my friend said, you know what? This would be a great place for a restaurant. There's a lot of hungry people here. <laughs> you know, and I and I just see I, I know it creeps in and, and I bet I bet you get that, too, don't you? A little impatience every now and then. Well, today we're going to talk about being patient. And not just praying to the Lord, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now, right? We're going to be talking about patience and that relationship with God and with one another. It's been said patience is a virtue. Well, Scripture talks about patience as being one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Paul, when he's writing to the Colossians, reminds them of this character trait. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And here we hear it again in James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. This is especially true as we wait for the Lord to come again. Be patient. I think people get anxious. And it's not just about the Lord coming again, but sometimes it's about the Lord wanting the Lord to do something. That you think is right. And you think the God ought to just follow along with your lead. Right? But we hear be patient until the coming of the Lord. Be patient in our faith. Being true in our faith. Be patient. It's interesting, I think, the way James writes this. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. What's this really talking about? There's a cycle here with crops, isn't it? You plant the crops, there's rain, then you harvest the crop. There's always a cycle to that process. And that's what we have here. God has put in place in this world a cycle for this world. He created it. There will be an ending point for it. In the middle of that time, Jesus came to be our Savior and our Lord. We have to remember that God has this thing all planned out for us, and it doesn't help us to be impatient for the Lord to come again or to act the way we think God should act. You have to be reminded of the parable of the wheat and the tares, as it's talked about in Scripture. It's where the sower goes out and sows the seed, and it's good seed, and the good plants come up, but then also the weeds start coming up. And the workers say to the master, do you want us to go out and chop out all the weeds? He says, no, don't do that, lest also you take out some of the righteous. What we see is until the end of time, good and evil will exist together in this world, despite the fact that we might want God to follow our will and our desire and to take out evil right now. But this is nothing new for humankind. We read in the Psalms where they're frustrated with God. Psalm 74, the psalmist writes, your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees and all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. 
We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet and there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. When we see evil, sometimes we think God should just take care of it right away. When we see evil happening against us, we say, God, how long are you going to take this? Take out your hand and destroy them. But we're reminded from Scripture where the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Be patient. As we wait for the Lord to come again, we recognize there will be evil people around us. There will be evil in the world. But be patient. Be patient by being established in the Lord. James writes, establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. What are, what are we to be doing? Establishing our hearts in the Lord. Trusting fully in His timing and in His ways in this world. In His time, He will come again and He will judge the world. I love the example James gives about waiting. He says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Right? Don't you think the prophets wanted to see Jesus? They prophesied about Jesus. They prophesied about the end of the world. Don't you think they wanted to see all that? But they didn't get to see that. But yet they were faithful in their prophesying. They lived in a wicked, evil generation. They lived in, in times that were not good, in times like the psalmist is writing about. But they continued steadfast in the Lord. They continued established as his people, proclaiming his word and speaking his word of truth. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You know, the prophets were looking forward. They didn't have the chance to know who Jesus was or to see Jesus. They knew the Messiah was coming. They didn't see him. You know what? We have we have a privilege. We're looking back and we're seeing that what the one of the things the prophets didn't see was Jesus come as savior of the world. We have the opportunity to see that and to know that and to believe that. And so in our time, we're, we're really better off than the prophets were because we know the Savior of the world. We have faith in him. We know that whatever happens from this point forward, Jesus is in control. God is in control of our lives. And we may not know what the future is. We may not be able to see what's going to happen between now and when the Lord comes again. But we know that he is God and Lord of all. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, even if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We wait for the future of God to be revealed. And we're steadfast in that faith. It says, uh, Paul wrote, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, remain true in that faith to the end. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. You know, when I, when I think back of all the people of Scripture that, that are examples of steadfastness, I don't think there's a, a greater human mentioned in Scripture of greater steadfastness than Job. You know the story of Job, right? Job had it all. The devil comes, says, Lord, if, if Job were to lose all of this stuff, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be faithful to you anymore. So the Lord says, take it away, but you have to spare his life. So he lost all his riches, his family. But Job remained strong in his faith. Job didn't know what the future was going to hold. But he remained strong in his faith. Yeah, did he waver maybe a little bit every now and then, wondering what God was up to? Sure he did. But he never abandoned the Lord. It's because the Lord never abandoned him. God is faithful. And he is patient with us. Peter writes, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should preach, reach repentance and to count the patience of the Lord as our salvation. Why is the Lord so patient? Why didn't the Lord just come and wipe out everything? Because he wants people to repent. He wants people in his kingdom. So he is patient with us and calls on us to be a patient people as we wait for Jesus to come again, being strong in our faith, established in the Lord and steadfast in who we are as God's people.
We have a blessing, my friends, and that is Jesus Christ who went to the cross for our sins. And we wait for him to come again with patience in our hearts. That's our relationship with God, to be patient with the Lord, to be patient and wait on the Lord's timing. And in the meantime, we also learn that we're to be patient with one another. James writes in his word here, he says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Don't be impatient with one another. Don't be grumbling because this person's that or this person's this or this person's slower. This person didn't do this way. Well, we wanted them to do this. Instead, be patient, he says. Don't grumble. I ran across this story of being patient. It's a powerful story i got to share with you. And it's not one that's written necessarily from some, uh, if I'm going to say, some pious Christian that sat on a hillside somewhere that had these wonderful thoughts about patience. It was written by a person that you would think might be the most impatient person in the world, a New York City taxi driver. Can you think of anyone that you think might be more impatient in the world? Maybe not ever been to New York, but I tell you, those taxis are doing this, they're jockeying, they're trying to get everywhere. But this is a story about patience that this taxi driver learned. It reads, I arrived at the address and honked the horn. After waiting a few minutes, I honked again. Since this was going to be my last ride of my shift, I thought about just driving away. But instead, I put the car in park and walked up to the door and knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail elderly voice. I could hear something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened. A small woman in her 90s stood before me. She was wearing a print dress and a pillbox hat with a veil pinned on it like somebody out of a 1940s movie. By her side was a small nylon suitcase. The apartment looked as if no one had lived in it for years. All the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls, no knickknacks or utensils on the counters. In the corner was a cardboard box filled with photos and glassware. Would you carry my bag out to the car, she said. I took the suitcase to the cab and then returned to assist the woman. She took my arm and we walked slowly toward the curb. She kept thanking me for my kindness. It's nothing, I told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother to be treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. When we got in the cab, she gave me an address and then asked, could you drive through downtown? It's not the shortest way, I answered quickly. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to a hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror. Her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued in a soft voice. The doctor says I don't have very long. I quietly reached over and shut off the meter. What route would you like me to take, I asked. For the next two hours, we drove through the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. She had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a little girl. Sometimes she'd ask me to slow in front of a particular building or corner and would just sit staring into the darkness saying nothing. At the first hint of sun was creasing the horizon, she suddenly said, I'm tired. Let's go now. We drove in silence to the address she had given me. It was a low building, like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under a portico. Two orderlies came out to the cab as soon as we pulled up. They were solicitous and intent, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. I opened the trunk and took the small suitcase to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. How much do I owe you, she asked, reaching into her purse. Nothing, I said. You have to make a living, she answered. There are other passengers, I responded. Almost without thinking, I bent and gave her a hug. She held on to me tightly. 
you gave an old woman a little moment of joy, she said. Thank you. I squeezed her hand and then walked into the dim morning light. Behind me, a door shut. It was the sound of the closing of a life. I didn't pick up any more passengers that shift. I drove aimlessly and thought. For the rest of that day, I could hardly talk. What if that woman had got an angry driver or one who was impatient in this shift? What if I'd refused to take the run or had hogged once, then driven away? On quick review, I don't think that I've done anything more important in my life than on that day to be patient. How often, folks, do we just think of ourselves? Do we get impatient with other people not knowing their circumstance in life and just allow our patience to get too thin? I thank God for forgiveness for when we're impatient. Patience is a virtue. It's what God calls us to be as we await his return. It's what God calls us to be toward him and toward one another. My prayer is that God will give us the gift of his patience. Shall we pray? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we await your return. And sometimes we're so impatient trying to bring our own plan into being instead of being willing to follow yours. Lord, forgive us. For those times. Forgive us for when we grumble against one another. Forgive us when we are impatient. And Lord, grant us your patience. A patience that's found in a steadfast faith. A patience that's found in being established in you as Savior and Lord. A patience that trusts you. Knowing that we are your people. And you are our God. Lord. Make us patient. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue with the prayers of the church.